Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So I want to address this before I get any comments. I know I look different now than I will in the rest of the video. I had some technical difficulties when recording this intro the first time, so I had to go ahead and re-record it, hence why I look completely different now than in the rest of the video. But that's neither here or there. The case that I have for you guys today is one that I've been following for pretty much the entire time that Daniel's been missing. Before I covered this case, I wanted to wait and see if any information would come out or if maybe he would be found because I truly thought that he may have been found at this point, but he hasn't been found. He's still out there somewhere. Now, I want to say right off the bat that police have come out with their report of what they believed happened, but Daniel's father is doing his own investigation. There have been tons of things that Daniel's father has been able to uncover that completely contradict what police have found. So throughout this entire video, I will be going back and forth with what police have found and what Daniel's father has found. I also wanted to go ahead and say that I've been working to research this case for a couple of weeks now, and literally the day that I sat down to record, I saw that the Mile Higher podcast had released an episode on Daniel, so of course I had to listen to it. I absolutely love the Mile Higher podcast. I love Kendall and Josh, and I think they did a phenomenal job with this one. They had Daniel's father, David, on their podcast to clear up a lot of things that, you know, were confusing. And honestly, it cleared up a lot of things that I was confused about, which I did, you know, I will go over in the video but I do suggest you watch that podcast as well. But before we get into today's video, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Green Chef. Green Chef is the number one meal kit with tons of options that work for your lifestyle. Green Chef is a CCOF certified organic company that offers options for every lifestyle. Green Chef has options whether you're a keto and paleo diet, whether you have a vegan diet, gluten-free, vegetarian, which is what I am, fast and fit, or Mediterranean. Green Chef makes cooking easy with step-by-step -step instructions, chef tips, and photos to guide you through the entire recipe. Green Chef makes cooking easier so you still have well-balanced meals while cutting down on meal planning, grocery shopping, and food prep. They offer pre-made, pre-measured spices, sauces, and dressings so that you can get that chef-curated flavor in so much less time. You guys know how busy I am with school, work, and YouTube, so honestly, cooking is not at the top of my list. I always just end up throwing together meals last second, or I honestly just get takeout. But Green Chef has helped me stay on top of a nutritious diet while cutting down on cooking and prep time. Plus, they're delivered every week, which also cuts down your time at the grocery store. I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like I hate the grocery store more than the average person. I find it so much more of a hassle, even though I literally have one like five to ten minutes away from me. I don't know why, but I hate going. It, it just feels like such a chore to me. Green Chef has so many recipes to love. I personally have the vegetarian option, which is so nice because sometimes it can be really hard to come up with fun and new vegetarian meals. Each meal kit has a wide variety of high quality, clean ingredients so that you can feel great about what you're eating and what you bring to the table and so you never have to get bored. I'm so excited for the offer that Green Chef has for my subscribers. If you click the link down below and use code RACHEL130, you can get $130 off plus free shipping on your first box. I think that's such an amazing deal. So again, save time and money by heading to greenchef.com by clicking the link in my description box below and using code RACHEL130 to get $130 off your first kit plus free shipping. Thank you again so much to Green Chef for sponsoring today's video and for supporting this channel. But with that being said, we have a lot to discuss in today's case, so let's just get right into it. Today, we will be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Daniel Robinson. Daniel Robinson was 24 years old when he went missing on June 23rd, 2021. Daniel was described by his father, David Robinson, as a brilliant mind who would never back down from a challenge. He was born and raised in Columbia, South Carolina, and he was actually born with only one hand. His other arm had not developed beyond his forearm, but Daniel did not let that stop him from succeeding in life or from being competent. His parents described that ever since Daniel was a little boy, he was a go-getter. 
His parents wanted to try prosthetics for him to make his life easier, but he didn't want a prosthetic. He was born that way, and he wanted to show his parents and the rest of the world that he was not handicapped because of his disability. Growing up, he played different instruments such as the trumpet and French horn. He tried out different sports like football and tried weightlifting, but he was more so interested in his academics and succeeding in that area. After graduating from high school, he went on to the College of Charleston. He went to college undecided, but decided that he wanted to be a geologist during his freshman year of college, and he worked so hard to achieve his goals ever since. He absolutely loved geology and was so excited to get started in the field. He had been involved with a fraternity in college, and he did the whole social aspect of college as well, but then he graduated with honors and went on to work as a geologist for Matrix New World Engineering in Arizona. At the time, his job was to check the viability of the water wells in Arizona. Arizona. He actually really loved his job and especially loved being in Arizona. This was a great place to be as a geologist and he was really looking forward to his family coming out and experiencing the outdoors and the amazing hikes with him. Daniel had a lot of different dreams and aspirations though beyond being a geologist. He wanted to travel to different countries. He was known for having a passion for adventure and he took every opportunity that he could to travel or be outdoors. However, even when he was out and living his life in Arizona, he was very close with his family and continued to contact them every day. His family, who still lived in South Carolina, had plans of coming out to Arizona that July to come and visit him. He also had plans with his sister to go hiking the following weekend after his disappearance. So on the morning of June 23rd, 2021, Daniel arrived to his work site for the day at around 9 a.m. and this was in Buckeye, Arizona, just north of Cactus Road, which is around 30 miles west of Phoenix. When he arrived, though, his co-worker, who's named Ken, said that Daniel was acting a little bit strangely. He apparently was looking off into the distance and talking about things that didn't really make much sense to him. He said that Daniel was continuously trying to talk to him about things that were not related to work. Apparently, he was asking Ken if he wanted to go rest, and then asked him if he wanted to go home, and then he asked him if he wanted to go back to Phoenix to take a rest. Ken said that he had no idea why he was saying these things, and they seemed pretty out of character for him. Then Ken said that he asked Daniel to check the weather app on his phone because that day was supposed to be kind of gloomy and cloudy and rainy, so they wanted to see if it was going to rain that day. Ken said that he looked down at his phone to check his weather app, but then when he looked back up, he saw Daniel walking away and saying goodbye to him. Then around 15 minutes after arriving to his work site, according to Ken, Daniel just suddenly left, driving his 2017 blue-gray Jeep Renegade. Ken said that he believed that he was headed westbound deeper into the desert terrain. After this, nobody saw or heard from Daniel ever again. Immediately after Daniel left, apparently Ken had reached out to his manager to let him know that Daniel left and told him that he was a little bit concerned about him. So Ken suggested that maybe Daniel seemed like he was extremely tired or he alluded to maybe he was on drugs. But David, Daniel's father, was able to figure out that that previous night, Daniel had been working very late. He was picking up shifts with Instacart to make some extra side money, which I will get more into later in the video, but Daniel was able to figure out using Daniel's cell phone data, his Google Maps data, that he had been kind of driving all over the night before. So the assumption was, was that he was doing Instacart pretty late. So he was up pretty late working that previous night, and then he had to wake up early for a shift that next morning. So based on what David found and then what Ken was saying, it really just seemed that Daniel showed up to work and he was really tired that morning. Either way, by 3 p.m. that same day, when Ken still hadn't seen Daniel return back to the work site, he started driving around for him to see if he could look around the area and see where he went. He drove around on the roads that they would have taken to get to the work site and he said that he did see Daniel's tire marks there, but he couldn't find him or his car anywhere. However, once again, this timeline is a little bit questionable because this coworker changed up his story a couple of times 
times as to what happened that morning. I'm not exactly sure what the changes were in the timeline, but that is what David said. He said that when he spoke to police versus when he spoke to him, he said a little bit of different things throughout time. So I'm not exactly sure what the difference was, but there was some discrepancies. It also came out that Ken had not called Daniel after Daniel had apparently driven off. He called his supervisor and said that he was concerned, but it was not confirmed that Ken actually called Daniel, so that's just something to keep in mind. If he was so concerned, why didn't he text or call Daniel himself? So that same evening, Daniel's father, David, noticed that he hadn't heard from him all day, which was very unusual for Daniel. Then he realized that nobody, including his sister or his mother, had heard from him all day. Again, this was very out of character for Daniel, so this immediately concerned David. And given that he was still all the way in South Carolina, David called Daniel's sister to go to his apartment where he lived in Tempe to see if he was still there. Daniel did have a sister that lived in Arizona at the time. It was his only family member that lived there. He had a sister in California, but other than that, the rest of his family was back in South Carolina. Either way, his sister did go over to his apartment to see if he was still there, but of course, he wasn't. David also went ahead and called one of Daniel's friends, but he also had not seen or heard from Daniel that day. So after he realized that it had been over six hours since anybody had seen Daniel, his father reported him as a missing person to the Buckeye police. He then jumped in his car and started the 30-hour or 2,000-mile drive from South Carolina to Buckeye, Arizona. After he was initially reported missing, police did go and search for him, but it didn't really seem like they put forth their best efforts at first. Police didn't really start actually searching for him or doing really anything until the following day on June 24th. That same day, June 24th, a Tempe police officer was dispatched to Daniel's apartment, but when he knocked on the door and didn't get an answer, the officer just left and didn't enter the apartment. Then that same day on June 24th, David requested that there be a helicopter search done in the area where he went missing because driving around in the desert in this rough terrain just wasn't going to cut it. Initially though, this request was denied. At first, of course, as you can expect, police told him that Daniel's an adult and he's allowed to go missing if he so wishes. Of course, in all cases like this, that's pretty much what they say initially because police know so much more about the missing person than the family. But after some pushing by Daniel's family, the helicopter search was apparently done. But even so, they told David that the search was done, but David still questions whether it was actually done. So after making this long drive, David finally arrived to the search area and eventually they had over 20 volunteers scouring the area but there was no sign of Daniel anywhere. They attempted to try to get a cell phone ping from him to locate him that way, but they were unable to track his phone due to it either not being connected to the same cell tower that it originally pinged off of, or due to the phone being turned off. They did obtain some cell phone records, which I will again go more into later, but they found out that he had not called or texted anybody after leaving the job site that day. However, after almost a month of searching with absolutely no leads, by July 19th, a ranger from the area located Daniel's Jeep overturned in a ravine, badly damaged, less than three miles away from his work site. So of course, this was something that really confused David because this rancher had found this car less than three miles away from his work site using a drone. He wondered why this rancher was able to find the Jeep when police weren't. He wondered if police really were searching as hard as they could, if they really were doing these helicopter searches how was this ranger able to find the car faster than police? But police said that due to the rough terrain and the location of where the Jeep was found in that terrain, it would have been difficult to see from an overhead view from the helicopter. Either way, the officers who arrived on scene noted that there was a pair of jeans that were inside out and then a pair of work boots and then an orange vest with Daniel's company logo on it, as well as a t-shirt and a pair of socks that were also inside out. They were located on the ground outside of the Jeep. Within the jeans, the officer noted that there was a wallet inside of the pocket. The police also found Daniel's cell phone, his keys, and his backpack with his work laptop in it, all within the Jeep. They also saw that there was no 
sign of blood or any other indications within the car that somebody had been badly injured. Of course, this was very concerning, but this did give them a better direction of where they should focus their searches. They used whatever evidence that they could find in or around the car to focus their searches. The police report said that they immediately brought other officers on the scene as well as six to seven cadaver dogs to search around the area. Apparently, they had searched for a total of 18 hours altogether, but they found absolutely nothing. Months passed without anybody finding anything in the searches, and due to the growing frustrations within Daniel's family, they decided to hire a private investigator to help with the investigation. So both the private investigator as well as the Buckeye police did their investigations into what could have caused Daniel's crash by downloading the crash data from the car's black box. So both the Buckeye police as well as the PI looked at the same crash report and shared their findings, but they came to very different conclusions. It was actually stated that the police downloaded the data and then gave it to the PI, and somehow they came to very different different conclusions. So I will be discussing what each entity found within their respective investigations. So I believe according to the original police report, I think it said that the car did not record the date or time that the collision took place. However, the PI was able to find out that the crash took place at around 1 p.m. on the same day that Daniel was last seen. So this would have been around four hours after he was last seen. It also said that the driver was wearing a seatbelt at the time of the crash, and I believe it was still buckled when the car was found. Police said that the car appeared to have accelerated shortly before the collision, driving about 30 miles per hour before it crashed. So this suggested to them that the driver may have been attempting to drive up the other side of the ravine before it crashed. It said that the car had crashed and then rolled over onto its side multiple times and then it was immobilized. It also showed that the Jeep had more than 40 ignition cycles after it had crashed, showing that somebody had tried to restart the ignition at least 43 times after the airbags were deployed. Then there was an 11 mile discrepancy between what the crash data reported and what the Jeep's odometer had said. However, police said that this should not be considered unusual because similar discrepancies had been reported at other Jeep dealerships. But according to the family's PI, he said that there's actually no evidence that the car actually sped up before the crash. He said that there's no indication of the car's speed, so he doesn't know where the police got that information from. He says, in fact, his investigation led him to believe that the car may have actually slowed down before the crash. He did an experiment on the same terrain using his car to see if his car could get up to 30 miles per hour, and he said that it just was not possible on this terrain to reach that speed. He also discussed that additional 11 miles that were reported after the airbags were deployed. He just doesn't chalk it up to some happenstance discrepancy from the car's system. To him, it says that the car must have been driven after these airbags were deployed, meaning that it had crashed somewhere else and then was driven to where it would later be found. He also said that the damage to the car did not appear to be consistent to the damage that would have been caused by driving into the ravine. He said that he found that there was red paint transfer on the car, which indicated that it had hit something else because obviously there's nothing in the desert that really has red paint on it. He said that the damage that he saw on the car was more consistent with a head-on collision. He pointed out that there was substantial damage to the lower front as well as to the windshield and the roof. He does not think that this could have been caused by a rollover collision from the car trying to drive up the ravine. He also raises an eyebrow at all of the weird circumstances around this crash. He does not think that these additional 11 miles recorded are just a mistake on the car's internal system. He also asks, why was there this four hour gap between him last being seen and when his crash was recorded? What was he doing for those four hours since we know that the site of his car was only found three miles away from his work site, so what could he have been doing? The PI wonders if this could have been a staged scene. I also want to note that in the police report, they claim that they had dusted for fingerprints in different areas of the car, but there was no full forensic examination done on the car to see if if, you know, there was blood in any word that they didn't, you know, overtly see, they didn't spray luminol or anything like that to really get down to what happened in the car. So we don't really know if maybe there's blood in non-visible places or if there was anybody else in the Jeep or anything like that. However, more information came out about Daniel's behaviors and possible mental health issues in the days before his disappearance. 
Some of Daniel's friends, coworkers, and family had described some strange behaviors that he was exhibiting shortly before his disappearance. However, as I go through these statements, I'm going to be going back and forth with what the police report had stated and what David had found. Because not everything in the police report seems to be 100% accurate. There are certain things in the police report that, you know, report that David said certain things, but David has come out and said that he actually didn't say certain things. It also had things in the police report that said his sister said certain things that David came out to say that she never actually said. So we will take whatever the police report says with a grain of salt. I tend to believe that, you know, if the police report said that David said something and he said that he didn't say that, I'm gonna believe him. So it's unclear exactly when this happened, but all of the posts from Daniel's Instagram had been deleted. I've seen it reported that it happened before the disappearance, but I've also seen it stated that it was after. We do know though that it was after the disappearance Parents that his sister had noticed it. So his Instagram had been completely wiped clean of all the posts that he had made. More reports also came out regarding a girl that Daniel had been interested in in the weeks before his disappearance. So like I stated earlier, Daniel had been working a side gig delivering groceries for Instacart to make some extra money. While working on June 12th, Daniel was delivering wine to a certain house where he met a young woman named Caitlin and then she invited over to his house to hang out with her and another young woman. He actually ended up spending the night there with the two girls and according to his dad, the two had some really good conversations and the two seemed to click really well. So according to the police report, it was stated that Daniel's sister told police that there was this one time that Daniel came over to her apartment where she lived in Arizona and she said that he was over there for about 30 minutes and then just didn't really say anything and then just left. She said that he was sort of just staring off into the distance, was totally zoned out, and when she tried talking to him, he just was not responding. However, David said that he doesn't actually know how police got this time of a whole 30 minutes. David said that when he spoke to Daniel's sister, she didn't mention to him anything about it being over 30 minutes, but that's what it says in the police report. So I don't know if this is something that police were just kind of assuming that, oh, she said it was a while, so let's just put down 30 minutes, or if Daniel's sister really did say 30 minutes and she just didn't mention it to her dad. But either way, no matter how long this was, David said that sometimes Daniel just does this. He said that both him and his son Daniel will have times where they just sort of zone out and stare off. I definitely relate to this because I've done this plenty of instances when I'm tired or just in my head or whatever, I just zone out and don't really talk to people much. There's literally been times where I go to hang out with my roommates or a friend and I just don't realize how much in my head I am. So I really do kind of like the same situation where I go there, I kind of just sit there and I don't really talk too much. And then I kind of just, I'm like, all right, it was nice seeing you, bye. So this entire situation of Daniel just going there and sort of just zoning out and then leaving, this could have been something or it could have just been something that was normal. So Daniel's sister also mentioned to police that there was this podcast that Daniel told her about that he said that Caitlin had told him about and that after listening to this podcast, it completely changed the way that he looked at life. He told his sister that this podcast showed him how to view things in the world with a positive energy and to avoid negative energy. Daniel had been raised as a Christian and this was a Christian podcast that sort of aimed at changing the way that you look at things. It definitely seemed like this was a podcast that really did change his perspective. It seemed like he really enjoyed it because he had also sent the same podcast to his dad to listen to. So he did say that Caitlin, the new girl that he was talking to, had showed him this podcast, but other than this, he didn't really mention anything else about Caitlin. However, in the police report, it states that Daniel told his sister that he was in love with a girl named Caitlin. So, we don't know. Did he really say this to his sister or not? It seems like David doesn't think that he actually told his sister that he was in love with Caitlin. Other than this though, other than him bringing up the podcast and the police report saying that he said that he was in love with Caitlin, his sister didn't really say anything else that stood out to her and she didn't notice any other weird behaviors from him. She saw no signs that he wanted to leave or hurt himself or anything else. Then police got into contact with one of Daniel's friends 
friends who had spoken with him on June 16th. He said that the two had spoken on the phone for about 17 minutes that day, and he said that he noticed Daniel seemed a little bit more hyper that day. He said that Daniel had told him about two girls that he had met when he was delivering alcohol to them, and he apparently told his friend that he had hooked up with one of the girls. The friend then spoke with Daniel again on June 22nd, and the two had spoken about different vacation spots in Arizona and California. During this call, the friend said that Daniel didn't say anything or do anything to make him think that he was going to hurt himself or that he wanted to leave his life or anything else that made him concerned for any other reason. Another friend that police had spoken to was a friend that had visited Daniel for a couple of days before leaving on June 20th. The friend was visiting because he was thinking of moving to Arizona himself. While visiting, he said that Daniel seemed very normal. The two took a picture together and posted it with the caption in four, referring to Suns and Four when they were in the playoffs last year. Once again, this friend also said that nothing made him think that Daniel wanted to leave or hurt himself or that he was acting out of the ordinary in any way. David also said that the two of them had spoken right before Daniel had gone missing, and he said that nothing seemed out of the ordinary with him either. He said that the two spoke about things that they always did. They spoke about the podcast that I mentioned earlier, and Daniel did ask his father a question about love and how you know, you know, when you're in love, and he also briefly mentioned that he had met a girl while doing Instacart, but that's about all he said. He told his dad that the two had some good conversations, that he slept over the night there, and then he said that he accidentally left his canopy there. Now, according to the police report, it said that Daniel actually told his dad that he was in love with a girl on this phone call. However, David said that this was wasn't even true. He said that he never told police that Daniel said anything about him being in love with this girl. Yes, he mentioned something about love and asked him about love, but that was about as far as it went. He didn't even really elaborate much on this girl that he had been talking to. David said that Daniel really just never had a girlfriend before. He had always either been focused on school or his social life or whatever, so it didn't really surprise David when Daniel asked him about love. Because again, he had never really been in a relationship before and it more so just seemed like fatherly advice versus him telling him that he was in love with this girl. So that brings me to this girl, Caitlin, that I had mentioned before, the one that he met while he was doing Instacart. So it seems like Daniel did mention her to his friends and family, but I don't think it went as far as the police report said. I don't think he was going around telling people that he was absolutely in love with her, and I think that maybe it was sort of a situation where he had said that he was talking to her, and of course he never really had a girlfriend, so it was kind of new, so he was probably excited just to tell everyone about her. But either way, when police found out exactly who this Caitlin person was and talked to her about the situation, she told police that her and Daniel were not in a relationship. She had only known him since June 12th, like I had said, she said that on that day, she and her friend were drunk, and that is why they invited this Instacart guy to come inside and hang out with them. She said that looking back, it probably wasn't a good idea to invite a stranger into their house, but she said that he looked really nice, he looked harmless because she said that he was a little bit short, and the fact that he only had one hand, I guess, made him seem really nice to her. She said that the two spoke, and they kind of clicked and hit it off, and that is why he spent the night there. She did tell police that when he left, Daniel had accidentally left his canopy back there. This was a canopy that he pretty much always kept in his car because, you know, he's out in the field with his work, and you never know when you're going to need something like that to lay on or keep shelter in. So they had exchanged messages that night, or I guess the next morning, going into June 13th in the early morning hours. I believe this was when he was still there, but either way, she had texted him the link to that podcast. After this, Daniel and Caitlin had spoken back and forth via text for quite some time. He doesn't know exactly everything that they spoke about, but he said that the messages that were found in the police report aren't the full set of messages that the two sent back and forth. Police didn't even take her phone into evidence to look at the text messages, they pretty much allowed her to upload whatever text messages she wanted into their evidence website. So the conversation that we have from the police report is basically what Caitlin chose to upload. So by the evening of June 14th, Daniel had texted Caitlin again asking about the canopy and asked if it was okay if he could come back and get it. She didn't reply to this message right away. She waited until the next day to reply and she said that it was fine if he came and got it and that he could pick it up whenever. He said that he was going to come back the following day sometime 
time that afternoon to pick up his canopy. However, that next day, Daniel texted her again asking her for directions back to her house, but she did not answer because she was out of town. She didn't give him directions back to her house, but she did see on her security system that Daniel showed up to the house and then went up to the door to see if she was home. Caitlin said that that was a little bit off-putting to her because again, she doesn't know how he got there because she never replied back with the directions. And she thought that it was a little bit weird that he went to her house without overt permission. Yes, she told him that he could come and get the canopy whenever, but she didn't necessarily overtly say that it was okay if he came over on that specific day. Her assumption was, was that he figured out how to get to her house by going back through Instacart and figuring it out that way. And that was a little bit off-putting to her. By June 16th, she had texted Daniel and told him about how she saw him on her security video and she basically said that she wasn't okay with him coming over to her house unannounced without her permission and she told him that she would let him know when she was back into town and that they could find a time and they could figure out a time for him to come over and come get the canopy. She also offered to put the canopy outside by the front chairs before she goes to work on the morning of the 17th. But after this message, Caitlin said that his behaviors became creepy and concerning. She said that he replied to her message with a heart emoji and then told her that he loved her. She did not reply to this message, but then he texted her again several hours later by 10 p.m. that same day, saying that he's sorry. The next day, Daniel showed up to her house again unannounced. She got really freaked out by this because, again, she did tell him not to show up to her house unannounced without her permission. So by that same day, on Thursday, June 17th at 6.39 p.m., she texted him to please stop showing up unannounced. After this, the two had exchanged more messages, which I will read to you now, but this is all according to the police report, so these are all the messages that basically Caitlin had selected to include in the police report. So there are some time gaps where there's really not any messages, and it seemed like, you know, one or the other was texting each other multiple times, so it could be really how this was, or it could be that this was just how she chose to upload them. Caitlin said, please stop showing up unannounced, and then Daniel said, okay, I won't ever again. Caitlin said, thanks, and I'm looking now, and I don't see the canopy in the garage. Daniel said, don't worry about it, I already have it. Caitlin replied with a question mark and said, I'm confused. Daniel said, I did grab it yesterday, I just wanted to tell you that I'm sorry for it disappearing the other day, and then at the end of this message, he put a frowny face. Then, a little bit after that, Daniel had texted Caitlin again and said, I can't stop thinking about you, and then after this, Caitlin did not reply. Now, I do want to note that none of the messages that I just read you have a timestamp, so we don't know when those messages were sent, we don't know if there was conversation in between them, but David seems to think that there was a conversation between them because it just seems really random that he would just send, I can't stop thinking about you if the two hadn't spoken all day and the only thing that they had talked about was this canopy. A few days later on Saturday, June 19th, Daniel had texted Caitlin again asking her to hang out. She replied about an hour later saying that she's not home and Daniel said okay. Then on that same night, now going into the next morning, Sunday, June 20th at 12.14 a.m., Daniel texted Caitlin again saying, I love you. Once again, Caitlin did not reply. Daniel texted her again at 8.28 a.m. and asked if she was home. She replied to this text an hour later saying, honestly, you showing up at my house unannounced made me extremely uncomfortable. I will not be home today, but I don't see us hanging out anytime soon. Daniel replied to this message saying, okay, but do you have any doubt? Either way, I'll have to be okay with your answer. And Caitlin did not answer this text, so Daniel texted her again on Monday, June 21st at 11.44 a.m. Daniel texted her, how are you feeling? And once again, it appears that Caitlin did not reply. So he texted her again at 3.46 p.m. saying, I'm outside of your place. Caitlin replied back with multiple question marks saying, please stop doing that. I'm not even home. This isn't okay. Daniel replied saying, I guess it's not. Caitlin replied saying, not you guess. I've told you this is not okay and not to come to my home unannounced. Daniel texted Caitlin asking, are you okay with me? Caitlin replied back saying, no, this isn't normal nor acceptable. Daniel said, what is normal? And then Caitlin said, making plans before showing up at someone's home. And if someone has expressed to you that you've made them uncomfortable, you need to back off. Daniel asked her, do you hate me? Caitlin said, I don't hate you, but please leave me alone. A few hours later, Daniel texted her, you're right. So just that little part to me almost makes me think that there were more messages in between them 
because it seems weird that he just texted her, you're right, after what she said to him. I am guilty of this myself. I've done it before where you delete messages in between to make it look like, you know, you replied to something that they said, but usually it looks a little bit off. It's kind of like, why did they respond that way? It kind of seems a little bit off. That's kind of what that seems like to me. I could be wrong. Maybe he just replied a little bit awkwardly. I don't know, but that does stand out to me. So when Daniel texted her, you're right, Caitlin didn't reply to this message, but by that next day on Tuesday, June 22nd, so the day before the disappearance, at 3.07 p.m., Daniel texted Caitlin one last time and said, the world can get better, but I'll have to take all the time I can or we can, whatever to name it. I'll either see you again or never see you again. After this, he did not send her any more messages and it appears that Caitlin did not reply. So obviously all of this is very very concerning, but like I said, it doesn't seem like these are the full text messages. Maybe Caitlin didn't include certain ones, maybe she deleted certain ones for whatever reason. Again, we don't know for sure, but it kind of does seem that way to me. I remember reading these messages before I even heard David say that, you know, these might not be the full messages, and I was reading them and I was like, this just kind of seems off. This doesn't seem like a normal back and forth conversation, even if it did occur over multiple days. So the whole, you know, messages missing type of thing, you know, police not necessarily looking into Caitlin's phone and sort of just letting her present them with what she wanted. That kind of does make sense. But either way, even beyond this, David thinks that, you know, there's no way that he just out of the blue suddenly became this infatuated with her. He said that of course he's waiting to get Daniel's actual phone record so that he can actually confirm this. So that's where he leaves it. He's not accusing her of anything. He's not accusing her of deleting messages or changing anything. He's just saying that this doesn't seem right. And obviously we will find out once we get Daniel's phone records to see what was really said. But David did admit that obviously Daniel never did have a girlfriend, so it's possible that he just didn't really realize that he was being a little bit pushy. Maybe he didn't quite understand that boundary yet. Yes, he's 24, but if you've never really been in a relationship before, sometimes you don't really know how to feel or to respond to certain things. We know that when he showed up to her house unannounced, it was pretty much just to get the canopy back. Yeah, it was a little weird that third time he said, I'm at your house, that was pretty weird, but the other times were just because he wanted to get his canopy back. So we don't really know both sides of the story. It kind of made it seem in the police report that Daniel was just being this creepo who was just showing up to her house and acting completely out of line. And who knows, maybe he really was. Maybe he was being a little bit creepy. But to me, at first, it seemed like he really just wanted his canopy back. Maybe he needs it for work. Maybe, you know, he just wanted it back for whatever reason because he needed it or wanted it. Doesn't really matter. I just don't necessarily want to accept that he was just being this creepo right off the bat. But still, even going through all of that, that still doesn't point to where Daniel was or what could have happened to him. So by July 6th, a Tempe police officer did go to Daniel's apartment where I think he lived by himself or maybe he had a roommate. But either way, this officer looked around to see if there was any indication that Daniel may have left. According to this officer, the common areas were clean and there were no valuables that were missing. He said that there was no indications of foul play anywhere in the apartment. And upon looking in his room, there was no indication that Daniel had packed up anything or it looked like he planned to go on a trip or stay away for an extended period of time. He did note, however, that there were blunts of weed in various areas of the apartment which by the way, in Arizona is completely legal. Police continued to try to search the areas and trace his steps before he went missing. They found out that on June 22nd, the day before he went missing, Daniel had visited a Waffle House at around 6 p.m. They got a hold of the surveillance video which showed him going there alone and then getting his food and then eating most of it and then he put the rest in a to-go box. Police went and spoke with one of these employees who was working there at the time that Daniel was there and she did remember saying, him. She said that she had never really spoken to Daniel before and she didn't really know him very well at all, but she did say that he went to this Waffle House relatively frequently, so she kind of knew how he normally would act. So she said that she did notice that on the night of the 22nd, he appeared to be acting off and out of it. 
She couldn't exactly explain why, but she said that just something to her about the way he was acting on that specific day just felt off to her. But again, we really don't know what this means or what to take of this. David mentioned that Daniel was not a frequent customer there, that he had really only been there once or twice before. So even with this, we don't know. That same night on June 22nd, Daniel had texted his sister saying emergency. This was something that they did pretty frequently when they were in need of help. It was like a brother sister type of thing that they would, you know, send each other a message if they were in need of help because they were the only family that they had there. So that night he texted his sister emergency and she called her dad kind of freaking out. He told her to go over to his apartment to see if he was home. And at this time he wasn't, but it was actually because he was at the Waffle House at this time. That same night though, he did end up going home and seeing his sister. He told her that he was basically testing her to see, you know, how fast she would respond if he texted her emergency. So this didn't seem like it was anything serious. It more so seemed like more so of a joke. Police then spoke with yet another friend and coworker of Daniel's who also said that he noticed some odd behaviors. So I believe this friend was someone who he had originally met in college. This friend's name is Roger and he had actually invited Daniel to come live with him when Daniel first moved to Arizona. Well, you know, he sort of gone as feet and saved up some money. The two both worked for the same company, so they would often carpool to work. Once Daniel got his job and got on his feet, of course, he got his own apartment and he lived there alone, as far as I've seen. Roger said that from June 16th to June 20th, he was out of state dealing with some family issues because his father had suddenly gotten very ill. He said that when he returned back to work on June 21st, he noticed that Daniel had gone into the office that day. To Roger, this was really weird because Daniel almost never went into the office. He almost exclusively worked out on the field. He enjoyed being outside in nature. So it was really strange to Roger seeing Daniel there. He also noticed that Daniel had cut his hair, which really shocked him because he thought that Daniel was trying to grow his hair out. So Roger asked Daniel if he was okay and Daniel was apparently very dry with him. He didn't really say anything, which was unusual. Roger said that he could just tell that something was off. So he asked Daniel if he wanted to go get breakfast and initially Daniel said no. Later, he then texted Roger and asked if he wanted to go get breakfast so they did. Again, when they were driving to go get breakfast together, Roger asked Daniel once again what was wrong. He asked about the girl that he had been talking to, if there was any issues there. But once again, Daniel didn't really say anything. As they were driving, Roger had gotten a call from his sister and the two briefly spoke about the situation with their ill father. After he got off the phone, Daniel asked Roger if he believes in miracles. He started talking about religion and God and told Roger that maybe he should start believing in miracles. Again, this was something that stood out to Roger because this was never something that those two had talked about before. However, according to David, once again, he was raised as a Christian, so this wasn't something that was completely out of the ordinary for him to talk about. Maybe Daniel just noticed that Roger was going through a tough time and that's why he brought this up. But then Daniel asked Roger if he trusts him and Roger said, yes, he does. But then Daniel started questioning him and saying things like, well, what if we weren't friends? Would you still trust me then? He then told Roger that he thinks that he needs to get rid of his ego, to which Roger replied that he didn't think that Daniel was egotistical. He just thought that he was a confident guy. Daniel then said that he needs to get rid of his story, which again, really confused Roger. But this was something that was mentioned in that podcast he listened to. After this, the two didn't really speak much more. And that was pretty much the end of it. Again, not to sound like a broken record here, but this entire conversation didn't seem super out of the ordinary. Again, he was repeating a lot of stuff that he heard in the podcast, and it seemed like maybe it really did just change his view. The podcast talked a lot about ego and changing your story and all of that. So that's pretty much what police have found in the interviews of people that they had spoken to in the days leading up to Daniel's disappearance. Police were doing their investigations, but at the same time, David, Daniel's father, was very frustrated at the lack of movement that he seen 
Epstein and his son's case. He's also very frustrated about how different his and his PI's findings are to the police department's findings. David's actually been staying in a one-bedroom apartment in Arizona this entire time doing his own investigation. David actually has military experience and he's been very diligent about all of his findings and he's been doing his best to stay as neutral and unbiased as possible. He refuses to give up on his son like he feels police already have and he's doing everything in his power to search for him. He's doing everything he can to figure out exactly what happened and to figure out why the police's findings seem to be so wrong. They do searches almost every week and I'm constantly seeing them reaching out to the public trying to find people to help with their searches. He refuses to believe that his son just one day got up and decided to leave his family. He is so confident that no matter what, he's going to see his son again and he's going to have his arms around him one day. Now, one more thing I do want to talk about is that during these searches that David has been able to do with their PI, they've come upon four sets of human remains. They found a human skull in a wash that was just south of where Daniel's car was found, but upon examination, it was discovered to have been weathered and in elements for much longer than Daniel is known to have been missing. They also found two human femurs, a pelvis, and a vertebrae. It's not known whether these remains belong to one or more people, but they are confirmed that they are not belonging to Daniel. I think there's actually a woman who contacted the PI and said that she thinks that these remains might belong to her husband, so Hopefully they're able to figure out who these remains belong to and bring this individual home and bring some closure to this family. Either way, David and the rest of the family are very frustrated that they seem to be the only ones who are making the efforts to search and to actually find things and police are not. Clearly it doesn't seem like the police's efforts are enough to actually bring anything in this case because if police were searching as hard as David and his PI are, then they would have found these humans' remains. They're also concerned that police aren't trying to search harder after finding these human remains. Clearly there's people out there who just have not been found. Why hasn't this caused police to up their efforts? There's been so many things in this case that David had said that police said they're doing, but clearly they're not. It's obvious that they're not putting forth the effort that they need to, and David is left picking up the pieces and left doing his own investigation and left to find his son on his own. So that's pretty much all of the information that we have at this point. It's been almost a year and we still have absolutely no idea what happened to Daniel or where he is. His family has built a website which goes over pretty much all of the most recent and relevant information and gives you information on signing up to help with the searches in the area. I've actually been keeping up with their page for quite some time, pretty much the entirety of of his disappearance and you know trying to see if there's a time that I can help search because I am in Arizona but unfortunately due to my school and work schedule I haven't been able to but I'm really hoping to get out there soon and I'm hoping that there's a day that works with my schedule and works with their schedule because I want to help in any way that I can. So now let's go over the theories in this case. So one theory is that Daniel had been smoking some marijuana that morning but this time it had been laced with something like PCP and it caused him to act out of the ordinary and crash his car and then I guess go off and succumb to the elements. So this theory is pretty much based off of the fact that Daniel was known to smoke marijuana pretty regularly. However, I don't wanna to put too much time into this theory because it just doesn't really seem likely to me. Weed is legal here in Arizona and he most likely gets his marijuana from a dispensary which obviously isn't going to lace any of its weed. So if that's the case, if you did get it from a dispensary, then I think it's safe to say that it was not laced and that this probably is not the correct theory. So the other theory is that maybe he was just really tired that day and then he drove off and then he got into this accident and then got a head injury. Police said that sometimes when people have a traumatic brain injury, they want to remove their clothes and go somewhere else. It was really hot out, especially knowing that it was June in Arizona. It gets really hot out there. So police think that maybe he stripped down, went somewhere to cool down, and then succumbed to his injuries, and he's just been out there and hasn't been found yet, or maybe a wild animal got to him. However, as I stated before, there was no blood in the car to indicate that anybody had been injured. There also was no evidence anywhere to indicate that he had been attacked. So this doesn't really seem reasonable. I also want to mention that David actually had spent some time in the military, and he was honorably discharged.
discharged due to a traumatic brain injury. He literally went through them himself and he said that he's never had a thought in his head of wanting to strip down after he got his injury. Then I also want to share my personal experience. I've worked with tons of patients who have traumatic brain injuries. That's actually one of my highest caseloads right now. And not once have I heard anybody say that they want to strip down from their clothes when they sustained their head injury. So this might just be showing my bias, but I think that if police are gonna go out there and come out with a medically relating theory that maybe they should collaborate or talk to a medical professional because I feel like most of us are gonna tell you that I've never heard of this in my life. The other theory is that maybe he left his life. We know that it seemed like he had a whole new perspective on life after listening to this podcast. We know that he was talking about all of these different things, so maybe he just decided to up and leave his life. Maybe he staged this crash so that nobody would suspect that he left his life on purpose. Maybe he went to join a monastery or some other sort of congregation. Maybe he became a monk or something like that. Maybe he left behind all of his belongings so that he could completely start over in his new life and, you know, completely detach himself from his old life. However, once again, according to David, Daniel's dad, Daniel had upcoming plans where they were going to visit him in Arizona. He literally had plans with his sister that upcoming weekend to go hiking. Plus, a lot of things that people are pointing to as being strange behaviors, Daniel's father, David, basically explains them away. He knows his son best out of anybody else, better than the police, better than any of his friends, better than any of his co-workers. So if David says that some of these things might not be weird for him, I'm gonna believe him. Some people say that David is just supporting his son because he is his son, that he doesn't wanna believe that Daniel could just up and leave his life. However, David said that himself, he is willing to accept anything at this point. For example, David had said that if Daniel truly was being really creepy to Caitlin, then he would have a sit down talk with him and tell him that those behaviors are not okay. He's fully willing to accept these creepy behaviors if they really were creepy like Caitlin is saying. All he's saying is that he wants to see Daniel's phone records to make sure that this is all that it seems before he just accepts that his son randomly turned into a creepo. Again, Daniel's father knows him much better than anyone else in the world. So I'm going to believe what he says. David did say that when this first happened, when all of this first happened, when he first went missing, that he did think that it was possible that maybe Daniel just wanted to leave and traveled the world. Maybe he left to travel and didn't want to have any strings attached and he just wanted to go out and see things. However, after looking more into the evidence, after finding his car, after doing the investigation on the car, he just doesn't think this is the case anymore. He thinks that if this were the case, he would have come back at this point. It's been almost a year. He would not have stayed gone for this long. He wouldn't just sit here and see his dad searching everywhere for him. He would not just stay gone knowing that his family is suffering and desperate and heartbroken. He would not stay gone knowing this, and David said that himself. So the other theory is that Daniel was met with foul play. David has mentioned that police are very open with the fact that they know that there's cartel activity in the desert. They're not doing anything about it, but they know that it's happening. We also know that there's other sets of human remains out there. We don't know who they belong to. We don't know what happened to them, so it's not out of the question that something could have happened to Daniel. Maybe he drove off because he truly was just that tired, but maybe he stumbled upon something that he shouldn't have. Maybe this entire crash was staged to cover up a crime that had happened to Daniel. Again, there was red transfer paint on that car, which made it look like the car hit something else before it was found in that ravine. It's not the police cars that made this transfer happen. It's not the tow truck that made this happen. It had to have been something else. So I don't know exactly how this all could have played out with the foul play theory, but there's a lot of information of things that happened in this case that make it seem that it is not what police are making it out to be. All I know is that we need to get Daniel's story out there. We need to get his face out there. We need to get people being on the lookout for Daniel to see what happened to him and to finally bring his family justice. So if you take anything from this case, I just ask that you share this video, share the family's website that they put together because they care so, so much about Daniel and they just want to bring him home. They're leaving absolutely no stone unturned going to find him. They will do everything that they can to make sure that the police are doing their jobs while they are going off on their own and searching for him themselves. So I really hope that by making this video, I can get more traffic to their website, 
more people out there searching for him, more volunteers, get people knowing who Daniel Robinson is and get people looking for him. Daniel Robinson went missing on June 23rd, 2021 in Buckeye, Arizona near Sun Valley Parkway and Cactus Road. He's described as being a black male standing at five feet, eight inches tall with black hair and brown eyes, and he does not have his right hand. A reward of $10,000 is being offered by the family for any information that brings Daniel back. If you have absolutely any information, I urge you to call the tip line at 844-602-0660. You can stay anonymous when giving a tip. You can also visit pleasehelpfinddaniel.com or their Twitter at pleasehelpfind4, that's the number four, and Instagram, pleasehelpfinddaniel. So that is all the information that I have on today's case. I know it was a lot, but I truly believe that Daniel will be found. I truly believe that this case will be solved. It just needs the right people going out there and searching or coming forward with something that they know or coming forward with more information or anything. I think this case will be solved. It just needs that last push. If you're in Arizona or any of the surrounding states, please make sure you keep an eye out for him or consider joining the searches. I hope there's one that I'm able to make soon. That would be really cool. I would love to come out and help with the searches. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!